Ishwaram's resplendent sun. It's the start of a bright new day. Time to rise, time to shine, Lord Divine. Time to lead us along life's way. Awake, Lord of Buddha Party. Chitravati's peaceful shore stands our heart's own mansion. We yearn to serve you and we long for your holy darshan. Morning's begun and o'er the world spreads the radiant sun. Yes, I, Bhagavan, may your glory now dawn. I offer my humble pranams at the divine lotus feet of Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba in the certain knowledge that I am but a flute in the mouth of the Lord. Jay Sairam. If uh, Rita can do it, then um, I suppose I should do it as well. Uh, when I spoke in front of Swami last year, I didn't have the nerve to start off my talk with a little song, because we all know how beautifully Swami sings. And I felt it would be inappropriate for my untrained voice to render a little song but I will follow in Ruth's footsteps. I am God, I am God, I am no different from God. I am the infinite supreme, the one reality. I am Satchitananda Swarupa. I am Om Tat Sat Om. I am Om Tat Sat Om. Swami said that to me and gave it to me in an interview many years ago and said, whenever you have a problem or a situation to face, say that little mantra. I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about the search for peace. We were in an interview with Swami oh, four or five years ago and there was a very distracted young man sitting there and Swami turned to him and said, what do you want, boy? You have to understand that most of us are boys to Swami. I don't know at what age we actually become men. What do you want, boy? And the boy said, Swami, I want peace. I want peace. And Swami said, and how are you going to get peace? And the man shrugged his shoulders. And Swami said, it's very simple. I want peace. I is the ego, get rid of the ego. Want is the desire, get rid of the desire. And what is left? Peace. Now that was important to me because it made me realize that peace is not something that you have to create. It's not something you have to go in search for. You are already peace. You are love, truth, peace already inside your being. All you have to do is to uncover the layers of Maya and find that peace. That is your birthright. It is our divine birthright. When we went out to see Swami, 
I was reading a book about Swami and in it he had talked about peace and he said how many times in a day do you say Shanti 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 he said after every bhajan you say Om Shanti 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 he said do you know why you're saying that of course none of us knew why we were saying it he says is to remind you that you need to search for peace on three levels and each Shanti is designed to remind you of the level on which you have to search for peace and those three levels he defines as peace undisturbed by other beings peace undisturbed by one's own body and mind and peace undisturbed by forces beyond human control he says of course that just the saying of Shanti 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 doesn't guarantee you peace at all it means nothing it's just words it has to be the true impulse of the heart saying it as with any bhajan that guarantees you peace so what is Swami going for well let us consider first peace undisturbed by other beings in the world in which we live today with so much apparent evil everywhere in the world and I say apparent because it is not evil we are constantly being distracted not just in our own surroundings but by world events we are constantly being drawn outwards to focus on the outer world which is all Maya and illusion with the swiftness of the news these days any disaster is brought before us within seconds within, within a very short time we're aware of all the tragedies happening in the world it isn't for nothing that newspapers are bad newspapers not good newspapers we had an English company try to form a newspaper which gave the public only good news it deliberately did not give bad news it folded within a month somehow there's a part of humanity that prefers bad news to good news so the world is a state of Maya and there is no such thing as evil as Swami has said nothing in this world is evil everything is my will and I would like to share with you a dream that my daughter had of Swami now Anne who is going to talk tomorrow and she's got a really good talk for you tomorrow may share something about uh, the birth of our daughter who is a Swami child but Diana has these dreams about Swami and I would like to share this dream with you now early one morning Diana that's our daughter came into our bedroom and said I had a strange dream last night in which I was sitting on the roof at one end of our house and Sai Baba was sitting on the other end I waved to him lost my balance and fell off the roof and then I woke up that was the end of her dream but on the very next morning she came into our bedroom again and said you know that dream I had yesterday well I had it again last night but this time I was more careful when I waved to Swami I held on firmly to the roof with my other hand and so I did not fall off Swami waved back to me and I then asked him what I should do he replied to my question by saying what do you want to do I replied I don't know what do you think I should do Swami replied I want you to do whatever you want to do I thought about this for a moment and then I said can I go to Africa to which he replied yes of course I then said can I go to America he said yes lastly I said can I go to India he said certainly so I then said Swami I would like to go to India the next thing I knew I was in India at put a party in the front row of the Darshan line in Swami's ashram and he was coming towards me saying you see I told you you could do anything I then felt myself going out of my body going right up above the world to a position where I could look down on the earth Swami was with me and we were talking he said to me isn't the world perfect I said Swami no it isn't you have people killing each other 
hating each other down there, and disease is rampant everywhere. Swami then said to me, go a little higher and look at the earth from further away. Then I was able to see the earth not only as it is now, but as it was and as it will be. I really could see everything, not just the earth, but its place in the universe as well. And from that perspective, I could see that everything was indeed perfect. I could see the whole picture. Unfortunately, while we are alive, we never really get to see the whole picture. We have to wait until after we die to understand the whole drama more fully. Swami then said, now do you understand that imperfection is only ever perceived, it does not actually exist. The problems that you see all over the world are just karma balancing themselves out. The world is absolutely perfect. Isn't that a wonderful dream for a 12 year old? So we have to realize that the world is Maya. What we are seeing taking place is the balancing out of karma, of other people's karma, and while we should learn from the observation of the lessons they are learning, we should not let that intrude upon the nature of our own being. We should not let the suffering of the world become our suffering. It's rather like if you're a doctor and you go to a tragedy of an accident, if you're full of horror at the sight of blood and what's going on in the accident, you can't be of help. You have to be detached from the suffering in order to be of help. And so it is with the nature of peace within our own being. If we are beings of peace, if we have the glasses, as Dr. Jumsai was talking about, of peace, then we will see only peace. It is the nature of what we are aware that determines what we see in the world. Everywhere there is peace, if you will but see it. And this world, as Swami calls it, is a drama. That means it's staged upon the stage of Earth. Now when we go to a drama, a theatre, and we see a tragedy being enacted on that stage, we know that the actors are only pretending. Indeed, if someone on the stage murders or poisons or does something really vile, we actually applaud them at the end of the act for having acted so well and done that act because we can separate the actor from the role that they are playing. And this is what is taking place in life. All of us are acting roles, roles determined by either choice or by the karma that we have created in past lives. And if you recognize that within every single being that is God, then how can you blame anyone for the role that they are acting? For everything that they are doing is perfect in the great drama that Swami has created. The drama has to be perfect because Swami is the author. We might not understand what we're seeing, but we have to accept that it is perfect for the world in which we live. Into our lives come many factors that disrupt our being. And do you know what is the most uninvited guest that comes into our lives every day? And that is television. Swami calls it telepoison. I wonder if we really realize how much television influences our lives in so many ways. For example, I have a daughter who watches all the young teenage soap operas and she honestly believes that that is the way life is as portrayed in Hollywood. She compares what she sees on television with her own life and she is unhappy. Because the illusion that's being presented on television is more real to her than her own relationships and her own friends in school which are different. Are we aware of the violence that comes into our living room each day on television? Of the portrayal of stereotype roles? indeed of outright lies that are told in order to make a program more sensational. It is so important if we have to have peace in the home that we control that on-off switch on our television. We must censor what not only we see but what our children see. So much of our minds are poisoned by what comes in. Are we aware of what we read in the newspapers and how much of that is outright lies from my own relationship with the press, 
Nothing that I have said or done has ever been accurately represented. It has always been misrepresented. So what can we say of the news that is reported daily in our newspapers? Swami calls them gas papers. Gas papers, gassing, talking, English slang. He abominates the wasting of time. And now one very dear to my heart, when Swami's pupils came back one term, he asked how many of them had even been to the cinema. Two or three put up their hands very boldly, and he was very cross to them. Going to cinema, waste of time and energy, waste of time and energy. He will not let his students go to the cinema. Why is this so? Because again, it is portraying what is unreal. It is bringing influences into our lives which will unset our inner peace. There is a program in England called ISAP, Inner Self-Awareness Program. And the symbol of this program is the lens of a camera. And you know how the shutter opens and closes in response to light. Well, the symbol is this shutter, because behind the film is spirit. And the lens is all the conditioning that we have accepted in this life, the maya, which creates the blockage onto the film of spirit. As we renew our link with Swami, as we become more God-centered, so we release all this conditioning, the body I am in, what is my role, who I am, what I've been taught, and get down to the essence of ourselves, the eternal Atma. And it is when we are in that Atma that we will find the peace that passes all understanding. One of the greatest faults that many of us have today is when we are affected by other people is that we want to judge what is happening in front of our eyes. We feel the need to criticize because people are doing things differently to the way we would like them. They're behaving inappropriately. As Rita has so eloquently said, you go to Swami and you're with the best ego crusher in the business. There is nothing he will not do to point out your faults, especially when you're in Puta Party. I was in Puta Party about um, two years ago, and I was sitting in the Darshan lines, and I had been absolutely spot on. I got line one or two most days, and I was feeling very pleased with myself. I was walking into Darshan, really prepared, really centered, and really at one with Swami. And I had a German doctor with me who was a friend of mine. On this third day, we walked into Darshan and we sat down in the line. I said, that's the line that's going in first. I sat down, and then after about a few minutes, I looked ahead of me in the line to see who was there. And I saw about six, and I'll say this with no disrespect, what I will call Indian peasants, very lower caste people. And they were coughing and spluttering and making all sorts of body noises, which I didn't approve. So I said, Swami is never going to let this line go in first. And I upped with my friend and we moved to the line next door. I said, this will be okay. So along came the Cosbit Lottery, the numbers were chosen, and you can guess which line went in first, the one I had just left. I said, Swami, how can I do it? How can I do it? I'm so judgmental. Thank you for pointing it out to me. You think I'd have mastered it by then. Two days later, in the lottery lines again, and there's this boy who's behaving very badly. He's jumping up and down. And I can see all the locals looking at him and saying, you know, these Westerners really don't know how to behave in front of Swami. And I was almost tempted to go across and ask him to sit down and behave. He was shouting to friends who were in other Darshan lines, and just being generally obstreperous. So I thought, no, I won't do that. But I wasn't sending him exactly very good thoughts. The lines were chosen. Which line went in first? the one with this boy in. I said, Swami, you've done it to me again. When will I ever learn that I, the more I judge, the less I love, the less I'm coming from that center of peace within me? Now, my line didn't go in for about 10 lines after that. But when I went in, Swami had contrived to have me sitting right behind that boy in the Darshan lines. <laughs> so I thought, this is going to be interesting. Swami comes along, stops in front of him and says, go <laughs> to this boy for an interview. I said, Swami, I finally got the message. <laughs> Swami also said that there was some particular lady uh, many years ago who was causing a little problem in the Darshan lines. And 
although they couldn't believe it, Swami called her in for an interview. And Swami said the only reason he called her in was because everyone was judging her and being so unpleasant to her and not sending her thoughts of love. He did it as a lesson to all those who are watching. So basically we have to learn that we have to stop judging our fellow human beings who are all actors in the stage. When we judge, we're not judging from our center of God, our peace center. We're judging from our conditioning, our own idea of what the world should be. It's very different for us to accept the ups and downs of life. It's very difficult for us to accept that whatever happens in life is for our own good. And no matter how painful it might be, to see it as Swami's will and to come from that center of peace. When you have this acceptance, when you understand that what Swami is doing is ultimately for your own good, you are in a being of centered peace and can accept anything that happens to you. On my 60th birthday, I was in Darshan and I'd read it, and I think it was one of Phyllis Crystal's book, that there's a nice little ceremony you do on your birthday. You take some chives in and you take a rose and Swami takes the rose, eats some chives and gives it back to you. So as I thought, it's very important birthday, my 60th birthday, and here I am at Puddha Party. I've had many interviews with Swami. I mean, I just know he's going to do the little ceremony for me. Well, I went into Darshan, Swami came by, didn't even come near me, didn't even look at me, walked on the other side in total disdain. And I was a little annoyed. I said, Swami, Swami, how can you do this to me? I've got, I, I have got this little ceremony all ready for you and you're not complying with my wishes. And I was very annoyed. And I went back after the Darshan and confided with my wife and she too was a bit cross, you know, Swami, we've come all this way, especially for the 60th birthday, and Swami, you're ignoring us, you know, this isn't good enough. She was annoyed too. Now, when I came out of Darshan, um, my sandals had been stolen, my chapels. Uh, yet again, I'd had three pairs stolen that trip. I have size 13 and a half feet, so they can't fit any Indian feet. I think they must be the, the amount of leather in them that tracks them. <laughs> So my chapels have been stolen. So uh, the only way I can get shoes to fit is to walk down the high street and put a party to the cobbler. You put your feet on a bit of paper. He draws a pencil outline on the newspaper and he cuts the leather to fit. So as I was walking down the high street of put a party to get these chapels made, suddenly walking up the high street, I suddenly saw this European, a man who I've never seen before in my life. And he walks up to me and he puts both his hands on my shoulders, which for an Englishman who's very reserved is a very threatening thing to do. <laughs> and he looked me in the eyes and in a beautiful, deep, eloquent voice, he said, do you not know that Swami loves you very much? And then he walked on and disappeared. Now, I knew that was Swami. So even although Swami rejects you on one level, he is the perfect mother and father and will always give you what is best for you if you will not judge, if you will just accept the role you have to play and what he wants you to do. Now we come to the second Shanti, peace undisturbed by one's own body and mind. If you don't have a healthy body, it hinders the way you can serve Swami because most of your attention is focused on your health. Some of us have lessons of health we have to endure for our own evolution. But basically, most of the ill health today is caused by wrong eating, by wrong drinking, by wrong practices, by not meditating, by not centering ourselves in the world in which we live. We, as Rita says, are the masters of our body. Swami is always emphasizing this. We are not our bodies, we should be in control. The senses, he says, are like four horses, five horses. You let those horses go wild, they will drag the body, the chariot, to disaster. You must be in control. That can only come from a center of God, the center of peace inside, which is the master. I think that um, he has emphasized on so many occasions the need to eat satwickly. We are what we eat. We cannot be peaceful if we eat rajastically. He gave the example once of 
two examples. He made the statement that one outburst of anger, one short outburst of anger, consumes the energy created by 30 days of correct eating. 30 days of correct eating destroyed one outburst of anger. He also told us the story of an Indian lady who, um, a very poor Indian lady, who saw the cow going by outside her house and the cow deposited its dung outside the house and she immediately leapt outside to grab the dung to make it into whatever bricks or they use it for but her next door neighbor also saw the dung and she went out as well a violent struggle took place as to who should claim the dung to be used in the home I don't know Swami didn't say who won the struggle but what he did say was that when that lady then returned to her hut and she had a young baby and picked up her baby to carry on breastfeeding it the milk poisoned the baby and it died such is the nature of anger in our own being we must be in control of our senses otherwise they will create havoc in the world if we are not in control of our senses we cannot be at peace with the world Swami has given us four requests in order to get our bodies into beings of perfect service for him he has asked us to give up smoking to give up alcohol to give up gambling and of course to give up eating meat I have been a vegetarian for 30 years so that didn't worry me but when it came to giving up alcohol I had a few more problems because I had a very nice French wine cellar down in my home and when my wife my strife pointed out to me quite correctly in the Sanasari Sarati what Swami had said I said well that was probably Swami just talking to the devotees that were there I wasn't there and I didn't hear it it's not applicable to me so Swami let me get away with it for a year and the next time I was in Puddha party he put me three rows back right in front when he was talking and he made the same request again and looked straight at me so I said okay Swami well that's got to be now I've got to do it and you know the amazing thing was although I've been drinking alcohol for 50 odd years that I stopped overnight it was no problem whatsoever with Swami's grace not just because Swami had made the request but because our minds are the masters we can do whatever we want to do we can overcome anything we want to connect with Swami's grace once the mind has control you can do it why has Swami asked us to do these things to create a peaceful sattvic being if you eat meat it's rajastic you take on the characteristics of the animal nothing dies so the sacrifice of the animal is good for the animal but the meat that we eat affects our being it makes us rajastic that is why some of the boxers drink pints of blood it makes them more aggressive because that's what they want to do by eating meat we are not only violating the principles of non-violence but we're dragging down our own body why should we give up alcohol I thought about this after Swami and he told me very clearly that alcohol drives the spirit out of the body when you're drunk you could drive your car much faster than you would do normally you do stupid things you risk your body you'd never normally do because the spirit is out of control and of course Swami says you never know when I'm gonna call upon you and learnt that lesson herself she'd had a few glasses of wine this is many years ago I must give her praise she became a teetotaler long before me and someone came up to her seeking advice about a situation at home and she couldn't concentrate because she would had so much to drink and she was saying Swami what should I tell this person and she couldn't help the person you never know when Swami is going to call upon us to be of help you never know when you will need to give advice in some critical situation you must have all your faculties available and finally of course as Swami says you never know when you're going to die and supposing you're drunk not in control of your being and you can't say the name of God the thought you have with you when you die is where you go I will an aside here there was a very great spiritual leader I won't tell you what his name was who was involved in a car accident and 
he saw this big truck coming towards him and someone in the back seat said the last words of this man and he'd been drinking quite a lot was bloody hell <laughs> I wonder where he went <laughs> gambling why does Swami ask us to give up gambling such a little thing well I said to myself Swami it's obviously because I'm using the money wrongly but if I give half what I earn in the gambling to you then I'm sure that will make it all right well I carried on doing the lottery and of course I didn't win so I said okay Swami maybe I've got the percentages wrong I'll give 75 percent to you and keep 25 percent for myself I still didn't win eventually I said okay Swami I'll give a hundred percent to you and nothing for myself I still didn't win then I had to think about it and Swami made it very clear that the people who are involved in gambling are usually the poorest elements of society they are gambling in order to get out of the financial problems of life and they are therefore spending the money they can least afford they are putting money that should go on other things now money is energy is karma and Swami says when you to win those sums of money you are taking on the karma of all those people and all that energy that's gone in so do you want a million dollars worth of karma to carry in lives to come that is why we shouldn't gamble and the second and most fundamental reason is we're basically saying Swami we don't trust you to give us what we need we're saying Swami you're not providing for us what we need I know what I need you're not giving it to me I must have the lottery to get my problem sorted out we don't trust God finally we come to smoking Swami doesn't like smoking for many reasons mainly I think because by smoking you are denying the flow of prana into your own life force being you are saying I'd rather take in smoke than life force there's a lovely story which we heard of one of Swami's pupils who was smoking and Swami called him in and was very cross with him said you mustn't smoke very bad for your health bad for your social development bad for your spiritual development don't do it again yes Swami very sorry Swami won't do it again three weeks went by and the boy was smoking again behind the sheds at uh, Brindavan Swami again called the boy in and said Swami what's the matter he said you've been smoking again boy no Swami I haven't Swami honest I've been very good Swami held his hand up like this and the flat of his hand became a television screen a video screen and he played back on his hand a video of the boy smoking behind the sheds in the party don't think that Swami doesn't know anything about you what you're doing so with all these things which Swami has asked us to do it's designed with one thing to make us better instruments of service and it is through that that we help not just ourselves but the world it's through these disciplines that the shutter will unwind and we will come in touch with the true sense of our being the internal infinite absolute bliss which is our birthright Swami says you're all trying to be happy so you should that is your birthright your birthright is to be happy but it's not to be happy through outer desires it's to be happy through inner desires can you think of the last time when you experience true peace and how rarely does that happen to you Swami gave me a wonderful example it was about seven or eight years ago and they were just building the Mandir a Puddha party the new Mandir and those of us who were uh, Darshan smart knew very well that after all the mob had gone to breakfast because they wanted to feed their stomachs after Swami had finished the interviews he used to come out and walk around and give fantastic darshans and those of you who are going to put a party I can tell you the best darshans are not at darshan they're in the time interval between darshan and bajans when Swami comes out sometimes there's only 500 people there and he wanders around quite freely and gives beautiful darshans this very morning Swami came out as we knew he would and he walked to inspect the building works at the back of the Mandir and he looked over and saw what was going on and then he turned round and looked at the handful of people still sitting there 
And it was one of those beautiful January mornings in Puttaparthi. It was a blue sky. There was a gentle breeze blowing through the mandir, just ruffling Swami's hair. There was that beautiful sweet essence of India you can only get in that Darshan area. And he stood there just rocking on his two feet like this. And he did this, what I call the two-handed blessing. Now the one-handed blessing is quite powerful, but the two-handed blessing absolutely knocks you back on your feet if you're aware of it. And he was standing there, not more than 10 feet from us, just doing this. And he must have done it for about three or four minutes. And he just said, happy, very happy, very happy. And I was totally out of my body. But it taught me one thing, that you don't find peace, it's already there, it comes upon you, you least expect it. And it is focus on God that produces peace. I was experiencing true peace because I was focused on Swami. There was nothing else in my mind but Swami at that moment in time. I was thinking of nothing else but Swami. Not of me, not of the Darshan, not of the people around me, just Swami. Peace, total peace, comes from total focus on Swami. And if you haven't got the physical Swami outside, because you're not there, put a party, then be aware of the super Sai that's always inside you to focus on. That focus will grant you inner peace. Now we come to peace undisturbed by forces beyond human control. And this is important in the times in which we live. One of the best protections we have is the power of the Gayatri. Swami once said to us about four or five years ago, soon after the Indian Airlines Airbus had crashed at Bangalore, killing a lot of people, including some devotees, he said, if just one person on that plane had said the Gayatri, they would all have survived. Just one person. Think of the Bible. If just one person in the city had turned to God, the city would have been saved. The Gayatri is all-powerful protective. It guarantees you protection in the world. Learn it, say it, invoke it. It's an essential part of your being. One of Swami's devotees was driving in an old Indian car and he had a terrible accident. He rolled over three or four times, but he survived unhurt. The very next day, there he was at Puddha party saying, Swami, Swami, thank you for saving my life. And Swami said, I didn't save your life. He said, what saved your life was your good actions. But I did stop the cars coming either way. What saved your life was your good actions, your right actions. Some of us have rings which are given us by Swami and they're talismans of protection. The air traffic controller at Puddha Party had a bad crash and he came and thanked Swami. And Swami said, yes, he said, in the ring I gave you is a little video camera and the whole time I'm watching what you're doing. But you don't need rings for protection. Your good acts will protect you. Swami says, and I read it to you, peace helps a person to know the future. Peace is, a sharp, is essential for sharpness of intellect. Peace develops all the beneficial characteristics of man. Even far-sightedness grows through peace. And it is through that that obstacles and dangers can be anticipated and averted. Well, it isn't just peace, it's that God self within. It is that intuition, as Rita says, that comes down. It is beyond intellect, it's beyond the conditioning of this life. It's the divine inspiration coming down, which will protect us, which will lead us to be in the right place at the right time. Perhaps some of you saw the case of the house in Los Angeles during the, the terrible floods about four or five months ago, when a whole drive of about 60 luxury homes was completely destroyed. And there was one house standing in the whole road of total desolation. So naturally the TV crews went to the house to find out who lived in the house and to ask their experiences. Well, the gentleman who lived in the house was Chinese and he was a Buddhist. And the interviewer said to him, why do you think your house was spared? And the man said, I don't know, but I do meditate every morning. Divine protection is what we all need in these dangerous times. For whatever way we look at it, this world right now is a dangerous place. And as Swami says, why fear when I am here? 
Swami is our grace, our protection, but we have to focus on him. And finally, I would like to close by reading one of Swami's great quotes. And I think it's so applicable to all of us at this time, in this situation in which we find ourselves in the world, which can be threatening. He says, Come just one step towards me, and I will take a hundred steps towards you. Shed just one tear, and I will wipe away a hundred tears from your eyes. I bless you only thus. May your bliss grow. I have come to give you the key of the treasure of bliss, to tell you how to tap that spring, for you have forgotten the way to blessedness. If you waste this chance of saving yourselves, it is just your fate. You have come to get from me tinsel and trash, the petty little cures and promotions, the worldly joys and comforts that you think you need. Very few of you desire to get from me the thing that I have really come to give you, namely liberation itself. And even amongst those few of you who do, those who stick to the path of spiritual practice and succeed will be just a handful. This is a great chance. This chance will not come your way again. Will not come your way again. Be aware of that fact. If you cannot and do not cross this sea of grief now, taking hold of this chance, when again will you ever get such a chance? Be confident that you will be liberated. Know that you will be saved. And go and tell the world that you went to put a party and there you got the secret of liberation. Many of you hesitate to believe that things will improve, that the golden age will come, that life will be happy for all and full of joy. But let me assure you, this avatar this divine body has not come in vain. It will succeed in averting the crisis that has come upon humanity. Jay Sairam. Sai Ram, everyone. I dedicate this talk at the lotus feet of Bhagwan Sri Satsu Sai Baba. I am just a funnel through which Swami can talk. Although this is the year of peace, get this thing right, in the Sai organization, for me personally, it has been more like a year of pieces. It has been a great challenge to try and get all these pieces together like a puzzle into a whole. We have been going backwards and forwards to England. As he just said, we are now landed immigrants. I can do everything you can do but vote. And uh, it's been really an interesting year. Swami told us that we would be working in England, working in Canada, and working over the border. And he's right, he's really got us moving around. In January this year, we were in Puttaparthi, and Swami was talking about this year being the year of um, the Chinese year of the white tiger, and saying that it isn't a particularly auspicious year, according to their astrology, but that it's very important that we all try and unravel peace out of the heart of the tiger. And this we do through our spiritual practices and our trust in God. For God, is, for God is everywhere and in everything, and God will give us everything we need without our even having to ask for it, or even know that we even want it. Now whilst I was in, in England, I came across this article on inner peace, which I would like to share with you. This is called Symptoms of Inner Peace. Be on the lookout for inner peace. The hearts of a great many have already been exposed to inner peace, and it is possible that people everywhere could come down with it in epidemic proportions. 
This could pose a serious threat to what has up to now been a fairly stable condition of conflict in the world. Signs and some of the symptoms of inner peace are a tendency to think and act spontaneously rather than on fears based on past experience, an unmistakable ability to enjoy each moment, a loss of interest in judging other people, a loss of interest in interpreting the actions of others, a loss of interest in conflict, a loss of ability to worry. Now this is a very serious symptom. Frequent overwhelming episodes of appreciation, contented feelings of connectedness with others and nature, frequent attacks of smiling, an increasing tendency to let things happen rather than make them happen, and an increased ability to the love extended by others as the uncontrollable urge to love them back. So there you go. Swami's told us not to worry about the world because that's his job. But as much as each one of us is part of Swami, then we're all part of his drama. And he uses each of us to work through as actors in his drama. So why fear when I am here, Swami says. So without fear, we will find peace. Now today, I'm actually not going to talk any more about peace because I have a subject I want to talk to you today that is very dear to my heart. And this subject is called weaning. Now, you know what weaning is? That's the difficult transition, transition from being totally dependent to becoming at least in part self-reliant on something or someone. And you know with Swami, he wows you, he woos you, and then he weans you. And without the weaning, I know that I will never find that true inner peace. So now I'm going to start with just a little bit, of, in fact, it's only part of a poem by a girl called Jessica Vaughan on weaning. Weaning is the pits. Weaning is the pits. All the heartache, all the anger, all the fits. Weaning is the pits. All the fear, all the threats and deep regrets. Weaning is the pits. But nothing frightens God, who created weaning and installed it as the plan to make his children grow up. So that's how the poem goes. Now this process of weaning comes in many forms, and I'm sure that Swami has been carrying on weaning for all his devotees for a long time. But for me, I became really aware of it in my own life on the 70th birthday. Over the years, David and I have been going to Swami. We've been getting closer and closer to him. We've been observing him. When we first went, he, we were like little apprentice devotees. He left us alone to go through our doubts and our suspicions and our worries. And as we sort of got closer to him and those things cleared up and we began to understand who he was and what he was, uh, then he began to talk to us and gradually we got closer and closer until he started giving us interviews. And when he started giving us interviews, he started taking on the problems of our family. And as you know, if you get close to Swami and if you touch him or talk to him or even see him, but mainly if you touch his feet, then he takes you on and he takes on your family's karma and that goes back seven generations forward and seven generations back. So he really helps with your family. Now in my case, I had a son and I'm going to digress a moment to tell you the story of my son. Now some of the Vancouver people have heard this, but I'm going to tell it again because for the people who haven't heard it, it's a wonderful story. My son Daniel, he's now 24, but at the time he was 18. He'd been to a boarding school in England, rather like Chumsai, and it had been an all boys boarding school, so when he hit university, he couldn't believe uh, the distractions, the girls, the drugs, everything else that was there. And he was beginning to go a little bit off track. So we were going to see Swami, and I was taking my 12-year-old daughter and my son, and David and I went. And we'd never had an interview at this point. We'd been many times, but we'd never had an interview. And we got to India, and within the first day, Daniel wrote Swami a letter saying, it's all right for the boys in India. They haven't got the problems and distractions we boys in the West have. What about us? Swami came out, it was Easter, there was, uh, it was in Brindavan, the place was packed, they were, we, they were sitting by the gate at the outside. Swami came out and took his letter. The next day, they were even further away, they were absolutely, they were at the back, there wasn't anywhere else to go. Swami came out, walked up to Daniel and David and said, go. So we had our first interview. 
We went inside and he told my son to come and sit at his feet. So Daniel came up and sat at his feet. And he said, and what are you doing in England? And my son Daniel said, I'm studying Swami. And Swami said, no, you're not. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your parents' money. Um, you're keeping bad company. And as for that girlfriend from London, ugh. <laughs> so Daniel thought, wow, this guy really knows a thing or two. In fact, too much. So Swami really gave him a talking to, sorted him out, taught him what education was and the purpose of it, etc. And at the end of the interview, we, he said he was going to Kodi and said if the family would like to come, he'd see us there. So off we went to Kodi on the, you know, the great big long marathon track behind him in the car. When David says you have to trust God because, um, you know, to be in that car race with Swami, if you didn't believe God lived in India, you wouldn't go. <laughs> So we got to Cody and Swami gave us another interview. And at this interview, Swami again called Daniel in and he's very interested in the, in the children, uh, Swami. He takes a great lot of care of the young ones because they're our future leaders. And he took Daniel in and he said to him, um, now have you learned and understood what I told you? And he said, yes, Swami. So he manifested a beautiful big green ring and uh, he handed it to Daniel and said, would you like a green one or a white one? In fact, he gave it to me first and I looked at it and thought, wow, that's a great ring. It's much better than the one you gave me, which I'm very happy with. And um, anyway, he, a little jealousy, you know, the mother, what, what's he done to deserve this, this boy in this life? Uh, of course, his past lives, who knows what he was with Swami. So anyway, he handed Daniel this ring and said, would you like a green one or a white one? And Daniel said, a white one, can I have the green one for my brother? and you make me a white one. So, and you know, me as a mother thinks this boy, he's been properly brought up and how could he even dream of saying such a thing? But my little Arjuna, and so who questions everything. So Swami immediately took the ring, blew on it three times and turned it into a white one. Now why Daniel wanted a white one was because he thought that a diamond was more pure and was more truth. And he thought the green one, which was peace. Well, he wasn't interested in peace. He was interested in truth. And that has always been his way. So Swami put it on his finger. He went back to the hotel, had a lovely evening. That night, Daniel was ill. I mean, really ill. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is my first interview. I've come to this man. I'm believing in him and trusting him. And what does he do? Make my child sick? You know, what's going on? So the next day at Darshan, I'm sitting there. Swami comes by and says, and how is your son? I said, well, Swami, he's a little bit sick. And Swami said, not a little bit sick, a lot sick. But never mind, it's purification, and in 10 days, he'll be a different boy. Well, in 10 days, Daniel was completely cured. We went back to England. He gave up the girlfriend. He studied hard. He got a 2-1 degree from a very prestigious university in England. And he got a, um, it was in film and literature. He got a job in LA. He's now been headhunted by a video company in Seattle. He's now writing um, the video games. And he's working on one called the Atma. So even in the darkness of video games, Swami brings light. So all, the, all this child's life, I used to say, those video games, they'll never get you anywhere. You'll never earn a living. They're a waste of time. He's earning more money than my husband did as a pilot. And he still wears Swami's ring and uh, is uh, going to make a really good game. So now I've digressed enough. We were blessed while we were there to go into Swami's house. And we saw many miracles um, besides the rings and beautiful watches. Swami, such a, he's such a jeweler. He matched my earrings and my white sari and gave me a watch. Now, honestly, how about that? Little details. So anyway, we were in his um, house. I'm going to tell you one more miracle because I don't think we've had enough miracles this weekend. We've had a lot of serious teachings, but I like the miracles. In this, in this um, house, in Swami's house in, um, up in Cody, David was sitting there on the ground beside, underneath him, and Swami um, did a wonderful talk, and afterwards he said to everybody, did you enjoy the translation? And I said, um, yes, I did. And he said, how do you know? You don't speak Telugu. And Swami says, I talk too much, and David thinks too much. So anyway, he went like this and he made this hand movement and underneath David said he could see this blob of yellow, goldy color like liquid and then it kind of went like jelly and then it got the form of a watch and then when gravity took over, Swami grabbed it, picked it up and said, what time is it? And someone said quarter to seven. He said, oh, look, it's right. 
And he gave that watch to Anil Kumar uh, for doing the translation. And, you know, when you see Swami take a necklace that's too tight, take it off, stretch it, and put it back on, you know that those are real miracles. You know, you can't, you can't magic that. That's for genuine. And we've been very blessed to see many of these very genuine miracles. When I see Swami, I have to tell you, for me, it was like a great love affair with my greatest friend. I kiss his feet, I hold his hand, I practically sit on his lap, I get so close to him, I'm very, very, um, I communicate with him, we talk, we chat, we laugh, I have a wonderful relationship with Swami. I show him photos of the family, of my horses, we discuss everything, spiritual and otherwise. So, when the 70th birthday came, even though we had two wonderful interviews and Daniel was sitting talking to Swami and everything was fine, a little voice inside me said, the time has come for weaning and Swami's gift to you on his 70th birthday is going to be to start this weaning process. Now, that might sound wonderful on one level, but on another level, I was very upset because I just so loved my relationships with Swami and the last thing I wanted was to be weaned off the form. I truly loved being with him and all that sort of attention. But God knows when it's right for you and he's Shiva and Shakti and the Shiva side said it was time for weaning. So what happened? I was sitting there looking at Swami up on his balcony and he was in this beautiful white robe and he was giving us blessings and everybody else was saying, oh, how wonderful. And I'm sitting there crying my eyes out, having just had an interview, but knowing that this is the beginning of the weaning process. My heart ached, my ego resisted, my personality screamed and my Atma said, at last. Go within or you go without. We all know that expression. So we came back and I had these terrible withdrawal symptoms. I really only wanted to go back to see Swami again. I couldn't bear the separation. I was suffering. Those who have preferences are doomed to suffer. I was suffering and I knew that I really had to stop resisting this and go with it. Since we've been back since the 70th birthday, we've been back many times and each time Swami has been weaning me a little more. He doesn't talk to me anymore like he used to. He um, still gives us an interview, but it's nearly always on the last day at the last minute. Um, even while I'm in the interview room, I can still touch his feet and hold his hand. But even so, he's gradually letting me know that I have to go within. I have to find him on omnipresent. And with Swami, he's such a wonderful gateway. His gateway to the omnipresent is totally one and the same. He can be Swami, the human, the man talking to you on a, on a one level as the Shakti level. He can be totally omnipresent as the God on another level, one and the same. Now with most of us, we have that omnipresent level, but we aren't aware of it. And we have our gateway is like so narrow and mine, I'm sort of creaking it open and it's so rusty and it's so hard. And I pull a little bit each time so I can get closer to my own omnipresent self. But it is happening and with Swami's love, and his help and his teachings, I am gradually getting into my own omnipresent self. Now, I'm not alone in this process, I want you to know. As Dr. Jomsar is saying, sometimes when one thing happens, a critical mass, it happens with everybody. One person picks up a thought and everyone does. I just recently went to Grant's Pass and I was down there with David, and it's run by Dr. Wilma Bronke. And she runs this Sci Center down there. And she's a woman in her 80s. She takes several groups to Swami a year. She takes care of old convalescing people. She's in her 80s, and she takes care of old people. She has robes given, by, not robe, but robes given to her by Swami. And they have literally buckets of vibhuti on them. You can just pick it up in handfuls. The pictures, you can't even see Swami's face anymore. And she is such a wonderful person, and this retreat is laid back. I have never been anything like it. This is Oregon on the border of California. Today, when I was going to speak, they said, you know, could I cut a few minutes off the talk? When I was down there, as I was just finishing my talk perfectly in my 45 minutes, they leant over and said, lunch is an hour late, keep talking. <laughs> So it was a very California retreat, but a great fun one. Anyway, Wilma told me that recently she's noticed that when she goes to Swami, she's not getting interviews so much. She's not having the same attention. Swami's gradually distancing himself. She's having to go within and find the omnipresent Swami. 
And also at Grants Pass, we met Jack and Louise Hawley. Now, you probably all know the Hawleys. They're the most wonderful people. Jack's written books. He's done workshops for Swami. And um, they've, been, they've been into something like 70 or 80 evenings with Swami in his house, close to him, in his car, having lunch and dinner with him, the whole thing. And, ja and Jack was there. And guess what he was talking about at this retreat? He was talking about the pain and suffering they had been going through in the last few years as Swami had withdrawn his physical comfort from them. And he says this, I quote, It seemed as if we were no longer a part of the worldly sigh. It is as though we are not to be close to the physical Swami, at least for now and probably from now on. We don't talk to him much and we rarely get an interview. But he goes on to say, Interestingly, however, we feel closer to him than ever. Our communications are 90% internal, which is very nice and more than adequate. At first, this separation was very painful. I felt abandoned, distant, as if I'd been fired. Lack of self-worth and all kinds of buried negative emotions surfaced. But gradually it dawned on me that it was not banishment, but a gift. Gradually, they both realized that they were not separate from Sai Baba, but that they were him. They found oneness in their everyday lives, and they no longer write Swami letters, and they go to Darshan without expectations, and they are now free and happy and at peace. Another pair of speakers there were Joy Thomas and Ray. And uh, David and myself have been to many interviews with Joy and Ray um, in Swami's presence and had the most wonderful experiences with them. And I, I've known Joy a long time. I go back to when I first collated the little red boxes. Swami inspired me to put together the sayings in the little red Sai Baba boxes. And Joy took a box and used them all the way through one of her first books. So we met at that point. And she's recently written a new book called Life is a Journey from the Self to the Self. And I highly recommend it. And uh, her, what is in the book? What is the subject of the book? What was the subject of her talk? Weaning. And most of us know that Joy is a very large lady. Larger than life, I call Joy. And whenever Joy does anything, she doesn't do it by half. She really does it. So when Joy, and it's always dramatic. So when Joy went um, out to see Swami, she'd been living there for a couple of years. They'd gone back to England, and they'd come back again. And she'd gone back to America. And then she'd come back again to Swami. And while she was there, um, she started getting messages, many internal messages. And every time Swami would come to her physically, she could see him standing by her bed. She'd see him in her meditations. And he kept saying, I am you and you are me. And this would happen again and again and again. But Joy was getting these messages that she was to go back to live in America. But she didn't really know if this was just from Swami or if it was just her imagination or what was going on. So she wanted to verify it on the physical. But Swami wouldn't talk to her. All he'd say is, I am you and you are me. So the day came when her group went to have an interview. And Joy was with them and she went up on the balcony and she's sitting on the veranda waiting. And suddenly the door opens and Swami lets everybody in and before she's got time to get up, he shuts the door. He shut her out. She was horrified. You can imagine. She's been with him many years and this is the great humiliation that we all go through sometime or other in our life of being turned away from an interview. Well, poor Joy, she took it very badly and she had a very hard time accepting it, but she gradually thought about it and realized that these visions of hers, I am you and you are me, meant that she had to get her answer from inside. She couldn't rely on Swami say, now you can go home, dear. Now you can come back, dear. And he just made her go within. So she eventually worked it out with Ray and they left and they went back to the States and she was there at the interview, um, at this retreat and she gave the best talk I have ever heard Joy give and so did Jack. They were the most absolutely inspiring talks. They were from their heart, they were full of humility, they were sharing their pain, their experiences on such a personal level. I had tears in my eyes through both their talks and I felt that these were two great souls who'd passed some sort of initiation and were sharing it with us so that we who will go through that process could understand better and have an easier time than they did. And so for them, for that I was very grateful. 
Joyce said what helped her was Phyllis Crystal. And Phyllis Crystal said to her, never mind, dear, this happens to us all. And Phyllis told the story of when she was with Swami, she went there with a very important question to ask him. And, and Swami sat her, you know, she sat there. And for two weeks, she sat there. And Swami didn't come near her. And she was nearly time to go home. And she really wanted an answer. It was something to do with her work and quite, quite a serious question. Swami didn't come near her. And the last day, he walks up to her and he says, go within. And she gets up and thinks, oh, no, go inside. That's right, go inside. So she gets up ready to go. And he says, no, 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 go inside. So she sits down again. So a minute later, he walks um, further and he turns around. He says, go inside. So she gets up to go to the interview again. And he goes, no, 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 go inside. So Phyllis said it was a great lesson to her, and she went inside. And as Swami said, if you ever want to answer a question, Ask him the question, sit quietly, and within 20 minutes, he will either give you the direct answer or someone else will come to you who has the answer. And that, that a book or a phone call or someone saying something will be the answer. So that's what happened. And again in India, I want to tell you that in January, I met this most wonderful, wonderful doctor. She was the, the wife of the new convener who's taken over from Jagadishan. I can't remember her name, but she was an eye doctor. And she'd set up a hospital in Kerala many years ago. And she goes back every year for a month and does free treatment for all the people in the area. She lives in um, Kuala Lumpur. And there she does um, three weeks work and one week free. Um, to all the people there and she's just a wonderful woman and if another time I'll tell you her story which was just amazing but right now all I'm going to tell you is what she said about the manifestations in her house she said that they had these um, they had a little Buddha that used to turn round they had Amrit coming from pictures they had the booty and all these things and suddenly they stopped and when her husband was there um, because he was organizing the Chinese New Year this year he said to Swami Swami why have all my the manifestations stopped why is that I don't have the booty anymore what's going on have we done something wrong and there was in the interview room there was this mother sitting there with a little baby on her lap and, and it was holding a baby bottle and Swami looked at him and looked at the baby and said do I have to bottle feed you forever <laughs> Swami has said as aspirants, you should grow up like infants in the lap of the mother and thereafter become the wise who can rely on their own strength, the divine self, and be free. He says that the mother cat carries the kittens when they're very little and moves them about. But the baby monkey hangs on tight to the mother and gets carried about. And he says, so we can start as kittens we can proceed to be monkeys, then we have to discover our humanness, and through that we have to come to our divinity. He says, take the Lord to be your mother or father, but only as a first step. That leads you to merge in the absolute. And again I quote from Joy's book, from an article by a man called David Coombe. He says, when a calf is very young, its mother gives it milk whenever it is hungry. But after it has learned to eat grass, the mother gives it a kick when it tries to drink milk again. After I learned to make contact with the formless self Bhagavan, he gave me a kick when I still tried to carry on drinking the grace from his physical form. He wanted, me, he wanted to wean me from his form. He wanted me to get all my spiritual nourishment from the formless self. Again, go within or you go without. So my friends, there is a nice way and a nasty way to undergo weaning. We can either learn through awareness or we can learn through our experience. We can wait for the kick or we can start developing a deeper relationship with our omnipresent God selves. The source of all life which in turn will give us such joy and fulfillment and bliss that we'll be at peace. Now I have had personally had moments of oneness when I have really known that the omnipresent and myself are truly at one. And the first one of these I'd like to relate to you today is when I was going to marry David. It was in a little church in Old Greenwich, Connecticut. I was working in New York, in a public, I had my own public relations company in New York at the time. And David was a pilot with British Airways and he'd come over because I was getting married in America because of the lady who married us was a great friend of mine. And we were in this little church the night before and we were going through the rehearsal. And as I was walking down the aisle, I suddenly felt 
this energy come down from the ceiling just it was like cotton wool and it literally came down over me and I thought it hit my head and then come over my head and then go down my body and I had never felt anything like it in my life before it was like the peace of God it was like the Holy Spirit literally descending and I was so blissed out I was so happy and I knew at that moment that marrying David was definitely the right thing to do and I didn't have to worry and I could commit myself to my marriage and to him and our lives to God and it was just such a blessing to receive that and at that moment even before I knew about Swami I had that that feeling of being one with God and the omnipresence and the second time that I felt this so clearly was when my daughter was born and I don't know how many of you have heard the story of my daughter but um, when I first heard of Swami and I went to one of these talks and they told me all about him and they gave me some vibhuti and they said this is sacred ash and you put it on your tongue and you ask for whatever you want and you know if you're lucky you'll get it so I thought, well, okay, I'll take some of that home and try it. No, no harm. So um, here I will digress for a moment to say, be very careful what you ask for, because Swami is often very good at giving you what you ask for, and you must make sure it's what you want. And here I'm going to tell you a little story about Vishnu. And there was this uh, Brahmin who wanted very badly to have a boon from Vishnu. So he spent 10 years meditating on Vishnu and praying and asking for a boon. And eventually Vishnu got so tired of seeing him doing this and he don't the right, so Vishnu appeared before him and said, okay, I'll grant you a boon. Now this man had been sitting for 10 years on a rock and he had not got off this rock virtually for the whole 10 years. So Vishnu said, what boon do you want? And the man said, the Brahmin said, I want justice. And Vishnu said, no, you don't. That's not what you want. And he said, yes it is, I want justice. And Vishnu said, are you really sure that's what you want? Because as far as I'm concerned, that isn't what you want. And he said, no, no, Vishnu, I know what I want. I really want justice. Vishnu said, okay, the rock can sit on you for 10 years. <laughs> so as I say, when you ask Swami for a boon, make sure it's what you want. But I did want a baby girl. So I said to Swami, I've got two sons and I really want a baby girl. Uh, I was 43 at the time. You give me a baby girl and I'll come and say thank you. And so a few months later, I thought, this is strange. I didn't know you felt sick in the menopause. <laughs> so anyway, it turned out that I was pregnant and um, in fact when David recently gave a talk in front of Swami at Cody Canal Swami asked him to give a talk and David gave the talk and he was relating the story and David said in front of Swami that I had said um, oh David um, you know Swami must be responsible for this and David said well that's strange because I thought I had something to do with it <laughs> and Swami laughed I promise you you could see his teeth he laughed so much so anyway, this daughter was born at home in Glastonbury and uh, I think we must have had about 10 people at the birth. We could have sold tickets. Uh, luckily, I'm not a shy sort of person. But there were midwives and doctors and my sister and David and my mother and any, anyway. So the, they'd all gone home and the baby was born and it was my baby girl and she was born on January the 22nd, which is a nice master number and she was an Aquarian and it was everything I'd ever wanted. And they left and David got, was in bed on one side and I was in the bed on the other and the daughter was in the middle and we sat there and the dawn was coming and you could just hear the birds beginning to sing and he said a prayer of gratitude for this daughter and I don't think I have ever felt anything like it I was in a state of total and absolute complete I thought I died and gone to heaven and that feeling was so powerful that I can recall it any time I just think about it and so again I know I was absolutely at one with the omnipresent now there's another time when you um, oh, the other time I want to just relate it was um, coming back from a trip very recently I'd gone through a lot of um, uh, heartache with Swami. He'd ignored me and put me through the ringer and done his ego crushing and what we call it, you know, the old washing machine stuff and, and, cr and, and, and um, making curds, you know, you don't get curds without beating up the milk. So I'd been through a really hard time with him and for a reason and I deserved it and I knew and I learned my lesson and it was very worthwhile. But I was coming home to Bombay and I got to Bombay and we had a few hours to wait before I got on the plane. And it was absolutely, I went to this little hotel and I just lay down on this bed and it was absolutely like time stopped. 
I wasn't hungry, I wasn't thirsty, I wasn't tired, I didn't want to go back, I didn't want to go forward, I just was. I am I, just I. And I lay there for about three or four hours and I thought, if you could bottle this and sell it to the rest of the world, you'd make a fortune. It was the most wonderful sense of oneness. I wasn't missing Swami. I didn't feel like I used to with the withdrawal symptoms of I've, of, of, I've left him behind and I'm not gonna see him again. I, he was with me, he was in my heart. It, I was just totally at peace. And it was such a fantastic experience. Now, I just keep thinking, why why can't I keep that all the time? Why does it slip away again? But even having had tastes of it, you know what the goal is, you know what you're aiming for, and it gives you the courage to carry on. So the last time, I, the last one I want to mention is just Darshan. I don't know how many of you have um, been to Darshan when you've seen Swami do these things like this, and you actually feel, as he's doing it, the energy coming in and tingling right up your spine. And even if he's back to you, you it's called, what I call backside darshan. You, even when he's doing it from the back, you can feel it. If he's behind a pillar, you can feel it. You actually get every single, it's like he's realigning the whole of your spine, the whole of your consciousness, and every cell in your body is kind of being transmuted and raising its consciousness. And I have found that I now don't even have to go to India to see Swami. I can sit and look at that picture. And if I study and sit and meditate and get in tune with it, I can feel the same energy coming from the picture, from the darshan, um, from when you have Swami anywhere in the world, in your puja room, in the morning when you meditate. I've got a picture of Swami doing darshan, and I, when, at the end, I look towards his picture, and I say, thank you, Swami darshan, and he gives it to me, and I feel it completely. In fact, I'm, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I can tell you one little story. Do you hear, know the story about the boy who took an exam? And um, he was um, asking Krishna to help him, and Krishna didn't help him. And so he took the picture of Krishna and he put it in the drawer. And then he asked Rama to help him, and he didn't do very well that day on the exam, and Rama didn't help him. So he put Rama in the drawer. And then he put up Saraswati, and he said, come on, somebody, you've got to help me. I'm not doing well on these exams. And suddenly... Um, the vibhuti, um, not the vibhuti, the incense that he had lit was going from the picture of Saraswati around the corner and back into the drawer where Krishna and Rama were. And he said, I'm not having that. They didn't help me. So he got the pictures out of the drawer. He got a hanky. He tied it over their noses and faces and put them back in the drawer. Ha, huh, I'll deal with them. What happens? Rama and Krishna appear before him and they say, we're here. What do you want? He said, what do you mean what do I want? Yesterday and the day before, I did terribly my exams. Where were you when I really needed you? And they said, ah, yesterday and the day before, you just thought we were pictures. Today you thought we were real, so real, that you tied up our mouths and noses so that we couldn't even smell the incense. Now, when you really believe in us, we can come and help you. It's the same with Swami. When you really believe that Swami can come down out of that picture and walk up and down here and give every one of us darshan, he will be here, not on the omnipresence, but physically in the flesh. He can do that anywhere, anytime. So every one of us has got to get to that point where we begin to really understand that Swami is omnipresent. And it's a word and it's an intellectual concept. But when it comes down in your heart and you really know it, now every Every time I go to Swami, every time I leave him, he, and he always comes up to me, and he always looks at me, and he looks into my eyes, and he says to me, remember, I am always with you. Now, up to now, I thought, well, that's nice, but it hadn't meant the same thing. But since I've been going through this process of weaning, it really means that he is always with me. I mean, that is so incredible. Just think, every one of us, Swami is always with us every minute of the day and night. No wonder Dr. John Sai said you've got to be careful what you think and what you do. I mean, he really is. He's not just always with you. He is you. He is that Atma, that higher part of you. And um, once you begin to really know that, then the weaning isn't so bad and you begin to really understand. Like all steps when you do this, it's a process. 
And some days I really understand and I really get it right and I'm so in tune with the infinite, I know what's going to happen, I'm psychic, I foresee the future, people think I'm wise and wonderful. The next day I get up, I'm so bad, I'm so off tune, I'm so out of sync with myself, I scare myself. So it is a process, one step forward, two step back. But underneath it all, I know that I am God, my Atma knows that it's God. Maybe my ego and my personality still need convincing, but that's okay. I've taken the first steps, and with Swami's help, I will start early, I will drive, safe, drive slowly, and I will arrive safely in the golden age, where we will, where we will all find perfect peace. And then I will be able to say, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Sairam.